بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته from a philosophical uh, historical and even a very kind of technical scientific if you will a pr uh, mindset or perspective there's a very profound idea that oftentimes people become very obsessed with the what of something what do you do but what really is impactful and transformative and transcendent is to understand the why you do something so there's two questions whenever you have a task in front of you there are two questions you can ask yourself what to do and why you do what you do there is what you believe when Allah Muhammad is a messenger of Allah life after death and count down the bullet points what you believe there's not a lot of power there I mean it's 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 powerful what you believe but I'm saying it's not like it transcends it is not infectious if you tell somebody what you believe they are not captivated and sucked in by what you're telling them but then there is the question of why do you believe what you believe now that's power that's where you hear the story that I was in a car crash and I almost died. Or that's when you hear the story that somebody, you know, did such and such for me. Or I was praying one day. Or I was reflecting, looking up at the sky. Or I was reading the Quran and I read this ayah and... Right? That's where that power comes in. And that's how belief transcends. When the question is not so much about the what, but the why. Why, why am I mentioning this? Why am I talking about this? See, prayer, prayer is mandatory. Right? That's the first thing we know about prayer. Mandatory. You have to pray. Prayer is necess excuse me, necessary. Prayer is important. Prayer is a big deal. And so whenever we process prayer and we talk about salah, we oftentimes obsess over what to do. What to do in terms of prayer. But what we haven't given a lot of thought to is why do we pray? Why is prayer important? Why is prayer necessary? Why is prayer such a big deal? Similarly, when it talks about the section description says that a lot of times as students or young professionals, busy people with a lot going on, we struggle to pray and have quality within our prayers. So again, when we try to solve that problem, prayer is a predicament for a lot of people. When you try to solve that problem, you are completely engrossed. You are obsessed with what do I need to do in order to solve that problem? But the issue is that to really have the experience of prayer and take the quality of your prayer to a next level, the question that you need to answer is not what, but why. Why are we praying to begin with? So what I'd like to do is I'd like to tell you the story about why the Prophet ﷺ was told to pray. And when and where he was told to pray. Like to answer the question why. Why was he told to pray? So very quickly, what I need to, I need to give you a little bit of background. And now some of y'all might be familiar with this background. If that's the case, then my apologies. I don't mean to bore you. Um, but bear with me, inshallah. I'll keep it as brief as possible. I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. The... 
Prophet of Allah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who of course we believe was, is the most beloved of God's creation, was the most remarkable human being to ever walk the face of this earth, is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is central to our faith and belief system, regardless of what anybody else has to say. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at the age of 25, he married a remarkable, breathtaking, beautiful, intelligent, confident, powerful woman named Khadija. Khadija bint Khuwailid. Radiallahu ta'ala anha. May Allah be pleased with her. Say ameen. He marries this woman who is just, like I said, just breathtaking. It's the kind of woman that would just leave you speechless. And I'm not saying that in some, God forbid, we're talking about our mother Khadija. She's a mother of the believers. I don't mean that in some lustful, you know, terrible fashion. When I say breathtaking, I mean from her akhlaq to her intelligence, to her character and her demeanor and her stature and status and you know, just everything about her was just, would take your breath away, would just leave you speechless. Years later, decades later, after she passed away, someone asked the Prophet ﷺ, tell us about our mother Khadija. Please inform us about our mother Khadija. And the Prophet ﷺ said, in response, إِنَّهَا كَانَتْ وَكَانَتْ She was and she just was. Which is the Arabic expression for I can't even put into words how remarkable she was. Every time I think about her and I try to put some words together, and this is the Prophet ﷺ, the most eloquent human being that ever lived. He says, even I cannot put together the words that capture how amazing she was. You had to be there to know it. You had to see her to experience it. I can't tell you. He says one time, he says that, رُزِقْتُ حُبَّهَا رُزِقْتُ حُبُّهَا and another, رُزِقْتُ حُبَّهَا and another version says, رُزِقْتُ بِحُبِّهَا which means that I was sustained through, by means of her love. Her love nourished me. Her love sustained me. In another narration, he says that, إِنَّهَا كَانَتْ وَكَانَتْ I forget the first part of the narration, but he basically says that, you know, she was the love of my life and the mother of my children. وَكَانَ لِي مِنْهَا وَلَدْ She was the love of my life and the mother of my children. Like just so remarkable. So imagine finding that person that as cheesy or as, you know, weird it may sound to some, but think about finding that person that you can call your soulmate, the love of your life, your better half. So the Prophet ﷺ marries her, and they live together, laying down to, next to one another, waking up next to one another, eating together, sitting together, talking together, praying together, working together. They spend 25 years together. 25 of the most remarkable, beautiful years. During those 25 years, during those 25 years, they've had six children. Two of whom passed away in childhood. Children. They had six children and lost two babies out of those six. But they grew closer and stronger together through that tragedy. 
Through those 25 years, the Prophet ﷺ received divine inspiration, revelation, was granted prophethood, and the greatest responsibility that has ever been given to any human being, and that is to preach the word of God to all of mankind and humanity, and they did it together. She was the first one to see him after he received revelation. She was the first one to hear it from his blessed mouth. She was the first one to accept it and believe in it and hold his hand and tell him that she would never abandon him and never leave him. And she was the first one to have his back and to follow him. And during those 25 years, there were 10 years of a lot of difficulty and suffering as a consequence of his message and his mission. But they grew together, closer and stronger together through that experience. Until finally, she becomes very, very ill. And the Prophet ﷺ is just completely you know, completely overwhelmed by Khadija and even the thought and the possibility of her loss, of losing her. Until finally, one day, she passes away. And it is personally, personally, from a personal human perspective, it is the most painful moment of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. To lose the love of his life, the mother of his children, the first believer, his best friend, Khadija radiallahu anha. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intends, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He tells us, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا He made the Prophet وسلم, the ultimate role model. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to make the Prophet وسلم, the ultimate role model, he put him through such test and trial that nobody would ever be able to come along and say, hey listen, you don't know what I've been through. Oh no, he most definitely know, knows what anybody's been through. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Actually, I'll come back to this point in just a bit. So three weeks after Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha passes away, Abu Talib the Prophet ﷺ is, Abu Talib has been very sick for a couple of weeks. Who's Abu Talib now, you might ask? Abu Talib is the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay, that's interesting. I have plenty of uncles. I'm closer to some than to others. But overall, none of them, you know, is somebody that, of course, I would, I would really be sad at the loss of any of them. But none of these uncles are of such a... I have the type of relationship with where I just... I don't know what I would do without them. The way you feel about like your mother or father. Like where you just can't even imagine your world, your life without them in it. But that's part of the problem. We don't know the life of the Prophet ﷺ as well as we should. And so we, when we say Abu Talib was the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, and that doesn't strike a chord and resonate with us, it's our fault. Because we don't know what was their relationship like. The Prophet ﷺ was how old when his mother passed away? Six years old. And the Prophet ﷺ was how old when his... Um, when he then went to... He never knew his father. His father was born a couple of months before... His father passed away a couple of months before the Prophet ﷺ was born. His father, the father of the Prophet ﷺ passed away very, very shortly before the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. So he never knew his father. His mother passes away when he's six years old. He stayed with his grandfather and his grandfather passed away when he was eight years old. That's it. There's nobody. It was Abu Talib who came and then scooped him up in his arms and hugged him and held him tight and quieted him as he cried. 
And he held him on that day when he was eight years old and he lost his grandfather, the last person in this world that he recognized, that he identified with as a child. Abu Talib came and held him on that day and never let him go ever again. Never let him go. Until the day Abu Talib died. So much so that when the Prophet ﷺ started preaching Islam and went, on, went to go and fulfill his mission, even though Abu Talib did not necessarily believe or agree with what the Prophet ﷺ was saying, he still held him and supported him. And said, I will have your back, always. That's who Abu Talib was. Let me describe a few things to you. And tell me if this reminds you of a parent. The, the, you know, a lot of times our living arrangement in those days would be that every family would kind of have their own like living quarters. Like, I mean, kind of think of almost like an apartment building. Everyone would have their own living quarters, but there were certain facilities that would be shared between some of the families. They were all like relatives, extended family. And some of the facilities that would be shared were like the kitchen facilities. Like a dormitory. And so what they would do a lot of times is in the morning time, a lot of the mothers or the women folk, they would prepare the food for the kids. And then at a certain time, all the kids would basically come and they would all kind of line up and they would get their food and they, they would put the food out on the table and the kids would come and eat. And there was a time set for the kids to come and have the breakfast in the morning. The Prophet ﷺ, even as a child, had such remarkable like integrity and character and dignity. He had such an air about him that the boys especially, you know how boys are, little boys, they're like wild animals, right? So, you know when they would put the food out and they would call the boys in, they would like attack the table of food, you know, climbing over each other and pushing each other out of the way. And it was almost like a little bit of a, of a, of a fight. And all of a sudden you just see this like movement for five minutes and then they move away from there and all the food is done. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ, even as a child, as like an eight-year-old, he would stand at the back, wouldn't go in there and fight and push and, you know, yell and scream to get some food. He'd stand at the back until all the other boys were done, you know, being wild animals, haiwan, Right? And once they would retreat away, whatever food was left on the table, then he would very, in a very dignified fashion. I mean, imagine an eight-year-old with dignity, right? He would go in a very dignified fashion. He would take whatever food was left, and he would sit down and he would eat it then. And Abu Talib, as the patriarch, as kind of the elder of the extended family, he'd be sitting off in a corner, and, you know, he would kind of watch this, and he saw this for a couple of days and he was fascinated by it. But he was also worried about the Prophet ﷺ. So he told the women folk that when they would come to put the food out, that when you put the food out, don't call the boys yet. Before you call all the boys, notify me. And Abu Talib would go and he would get like a little plate and he would put some food onto it and he would pull it aside. And they said, now you can call the animals. And then all the boys would come and attack the food again. And then he would call the Prophet ﷺ and he would sit him down in his lap. And he would take the plate of food in his lap and he would feed him. That's who Abu Talib was to the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Talib being the head of the household and the head of the tribe for that matter. Nobody would eat until he joined the table. Especially for dinner that was kind of like a formal affair. Nobody would start eating until Abu Talib came and sat at the head of the table. That was the protocol. But when Abu Talib would come, he would come and he would stand and he would look and he would say, Ain Muhammad, Aina Ibni. Where's my boy? Where's my son? Where's Muhammad? And they would say, you know, he's a child. You know, especially some of the, maybe the other elders, you know. They would get kind of annoyed like, why are we sitting around here waiting for some eight-year-old? Like, it's, it's, it's humiliating. We're a bunch of grown people here. We wait for him, of course, but why don't you sit around here, wait for some eight-year-old? And Abu Talib would just get up and he would say, I am not sitting and I will not eat until my, my son eats here with me. 
And then somebody would have to go and find the Prophet ﷺ. And he would be with the kids playing, running around. And they would bring him. And he would, be, he would come and Abu Talib would ask him. He said, son, sit and eat with us. And he would say, no, I actually already ate. And he would say, okay, fine. If you've eaten, then it's good. But he would not start eating and thereby not allow anyone else to eat until he had first confirmed that the Prophet ﷺ had not eaten. That's who Abu Talib was to the Prophet ﷺ. That's who he was. When the Prophet ﷺ, first time he got his first job, he guess who he got permission from? Abu Talib. When he wanted to marry Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anhu, we talked about, guess who he went and consulted with? Abu Talib. When he had his first child, guess who he asked to come and see the child? Abu Talib. That was who Abu Talib was. He was like a parent to the Prophet ﷺ. And he passes away three weeks after the Prophet ﷺ lost Khadija radiallahu anha. Three weeks. It is unfathomable how somebody could handle that. Such a devastating loss. One on top of another. I remember, I told this story before, so if you've heard me tell this story, I apologize. Um, I was talking about this tragic, you know, experience from the personal life of the Prophet ﷺ. And while I was talking about this, and I was basically kind of talking about it like I am here, a brother came to me afterwards, and he said, you know what, what you just talked about really resonated with me and really hit home for me. And I asked him, you know, sometimes just the look in someone's eyes tells you that they have a story to tell. So I asked him, I said, if you don't mind, right, if you could tell me how you relate to what I just talked about, so I can learn, because alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, I haven't experienced that type of tragedy in my life. So he goes on to tell me that, you know, I was married for four or five years, I was, um, you know, uh, going to med school, I was in my residency, we had two little babies, you know, like two and three year old, and we were, you know, completely in love with each other, our babies, our kids, were just Beautiful. Just, you can't, like, they just, it just completed everything. And even from a financial perspective, I was going through med school when we first got married. Then I was going through residency while we had children. It was very difficult. It was very hard. We had one beat down, broken down car. We had a small, tiny little busted up apartment. You know, we didn't have a lot of money to do a lot of stuff. But I was about to, you know, take the next step in terms of my career. Already the offers I were getting were very, very lucrative. We had already started to look at nice areas and neighborhoods and schools and houses and brand new cars and minivans. Like, it was all coming together. It was already just so great. And it was about to get better. I couldn't dream up a better life than this. And I come home one day, a little bit earlier than I normally would. And it was a time when my wife, she would, you know, babies, they need their naps. And I, she, it was a time that she would, you know, give them a nap. And she herself would get some rest at that time as well. So I came home at that time. And of course, I didn't want to, you know, come barging into the house, announcing my arrival. Normally, as you enjoy doing to meet your kids and your family. So I just kind of came in very quietly. I fixed myself up some food. I sat down. I had some studying to do. So I sat down with my books, and I ate something. And I was very just being very quiet. 
And after a little while, you know when kids wake up and you can start to hear them cry and they get kind of fussy and they start to call out for you? So I heard one kid start to cry. Then I heard the second kid start to cry. I got really excited. Oh, they're awake. Yay. Party time. So I go to the room really excited and I walk in and on the bed, my wife is lying there motionless with both kids, one on the either side, sitting next to her crying. You know, especially if the kid sees you in front of them and they're crying because they're hungry or they want to be picked up or whatever and then you're not responding. They just, the volume keeps increasing. So they're screaming their heads off and she's literally not even flinching. And that would be bizarre enough for any normal person like myself to notice. But him being a physician, he immediately realized something's wrong. And he went in to check on her. And when he checked her, he said she had already been dead for a while. Inexplicably, unannounced, unexpected, she passed away in her sleep. Maybe even before I had gotten home. My kids had been lying there sleeping next to the lifeless body of their mother. He said, at that moment, my world fell apart. I didn't know what I'm supposed to do with myself. I didn't know. I locked myself in a room and didn't come out for weeks. I didn't even hold my own children. My mother and my brother and my family members took care of my kids. Because just nothing made sense to me anymore. Eventually, I started to kind of snap out of it. I started reconnecting with my kids, figuring out life, how I'm going to, you know, uh, take care of them. Eventually, figured out a way, found a way to go back to work. And started getting my life back on track as much as I could. But there was one big issue. My iman was gone. It just, my, that part of me was just gone. It was broken. I didn't know what to do. And my brother, who's very devout, but not the type of devout person that just kind of like talks down to you, that just preaches at you. Not that type of devout person, but somebody who took care of my kids when I didn't know how. That guy. But also very devout. Practicing. Very lovingly, gently, he stayed on my case. Come on, pray with me. Pray with me. Pray with me. And I kept resisting. Just leave me alone. I don't want to talk about that. Just, you don't know. And eventually he kept telling me, pray with me, pray with me. Don't worry. If you pray with me, it'll be okay. You just need to pray. You need to talk to Allah. And I said, no, you don't know what's going on with me. He said, and brother... I was talking about this, the, the tra personal tragedy of the Prophet ﷺ. In the Friday khutbah, I was mentioning it. And he said, this morning, I didn't have work. My mom was available to watch the babies. And my brother came to my house. And he said, brother, you know I love you. He said, I haven't prayed in a year. It's been a year since my wife died and I have not prayed. I've not put my head on the ground in front of Allah for a year since she died. And he came to my house this morning and he said, Brother, you know I love you. I would do anything for you and your babies. But I ain't going to take no for an answer today. You are coming and praying Juma with me. I've done everything I can for you. I need, fine, you might not do it for the right reasons today, but you are going to come with me and pray with me today. You're coming. So I said, you know what, okay. And I came here, and you talked about the Prophet ﷺ losing his wife and his uncle, and having to look into the eyes of his innocent 8, 10-year-old daughter, beloved daughter Fatima, and explain to her that mom is never coming home again. And I realized at this moment that just like the Prophet ﷺ got through it, I can also get through it. I was so, this brother has been telling me this, just like I'm sharing the story with you. 
It was such a powerful experience to just hear it from him. And he said, when I, put my, when I came here to Jumu'ah and I heard this about the Prophet ﷺ, and then we stood up and we prayed. And I said, Allahu Akbar, and I tied my hands. And I went in ruku, and then when I went into sujood and my face hit the ground, life made sense again. Everything worked out. And I could figure everything out again. And that's to answer the question, why? Every single person has their own scars and their own wounds that they bear. Some are more public, some are more private. But realize that prayer is the healing for all of those wounds and scars. After the Prophet ﷺ lost his beloved wife Khadija, then he lost his beloved uncle, who was his entire family, Abu Talib. He was so devastated and heartbroken that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called him on the most miraculous journey any human being has ever enjoyed, the journey of al-Isra wal-Mi'raj, called him above the seven heavens and there gave him the gift of prayer. Allahu Akbar. Gave him the gift of salah. That just like you have suffered and you have felt pain, the thing that will heal your pain will ease your suffering, is this prayer. And that's what we need to remember. That all of us will suffer and feel pain. And we all, like I said, have our own problems and issues and wounds and scars. But prayer can heal those wounds. Salah can fix it. You just have to make wudu, stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, say Allahu Akbar, talk to Allah and put your face on the ground in front of Allah. And see how everything gets better and everything makes sense. That is the why we pray. There's a long discussion we can have about what prayer is, but this answers the question of why do we pray. So remember that inshallah, as you stand for your prayer and you go forward. Um, so, Real quickly, I'll just add a little something here at the end. And that is, I talked about this earlier today, again, at a com completely different session, but again, in case you were there, I apologize. You know, after realizing why you pray, that's a big part of solving this equation. Of having prayer be something powerful in your life. The second thing I want to give to you is understanding what you are saying in the prayer. I talked, like I said, I talked about this earlier, but understanding what you say in the prayer is very, very powerful. You know, you guys, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and bless you. You've been listening to me talk now for 30, 35 minutes. And it's I really appreciate it, and a lot of credit goes to you. But there's a very simple reason why you can continue to listen to me for 30 minutes, even though somebody's jamming out next door to us. <laughs> and the reason why you're able to do that is because you can understand the words that I'm speaking. You understand the words that are coming out of my mouth. You understand them. You comprehend them. And therefore, you pay attention and you listen to them. Seems like when I get louder, they get louder. Right? <laughs> but... That's the very simple reason why. But here's the thing. If I was standing here talking in a language you did not understand, you would have stopped paying attention a long time ago. You could not, I challenge you, you could not continue to pay attention for 60 seconds if I was speaking in a language you don't understand. And that sounds pretty accurate, right? You're usually dialed in, right? Tarawi prayer in Ramadan. You're pretty dialed in for the first 60 seconds and then it's like, <laughs> it's like, no, 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 focus, right? It's just you just wander off. Start reading people's shirts. If you can read this, you have bad khushua, right? Like, it should be a t-shirt. Trademark, don't steal it. So, but you get my point. You can understand what I'm saying, so you listen. But if you couldn't understand what I was saying, 
you couldn't pay attention. We have to learn to understand what we're actually saying in our prayer. Oh, and when you do, it is so powerful. The, the most perfect words ever were picked out by Allah and placed within the prayer and taught to us by the Prophet ﷺ. Just the most basic initial introductory phrase that we say within the prayer is Allahu Akbar. So perfect. What does Allahu Akbar mean? Allah, of course, is the name of Allah. Akbar comes from the root word, which means for something to be big. A lot of times it's translated as Allah is the greatest. Akbar is actually the comparative, not the superlative. Which means that it means greater, not greatest. So Allahu Akbar actually means Allah is greater. But that seems like an incomplete sentence. Because if I say Ahmad is faster than... You're waiting for me to finish. Khalid. You need me to finish the sentence. Ahmad is faster than Khalid. But if I say Ahmad is faster than... It's blank. I've left it open-ended. So similarly, Allahu Akbar means Allah is greater... Blank. Allah is greater than... Blank. It's left open-ended. And this is done as a rhetorical device within classical Arabic, deliberately, intentionally. Why? Because wherever there is a blank like that, you're supposed to fill in the blank yourself. So Allah is greater than blank. What goes in the blank? Whatever it is right now, at this moment, when you stand up to pray, that is trying to take you away from the prayer. So if your phone is ringing, Allah is greater than this phone call. If the game is on TV, and you go off to the side to pray, Allah is greater than the game. If there's a concert going on next door, Allah is greater than the concert. If your buddy is waiting for you outside to go grab a bite to eat, Allah is greater than the food. Whatever it is that is trying to pull you away from the prayer, you say Allahu Akbar and you think, Allah is more important, Allah is greater than whatever it is that is trying to take me away from Allah right now. Think about that, chew on that the next time you say Allahu Akbar and see how it changes your life. That's prayer. Number one, focus on the why you pray. And number two, learn to understand the meaning. In, we have an intelligent faith in religion. An education, a, a, a religion, excuse me, a religion of education. Iqara, read, not recite. Read. What is the difference between read and recite? Recite is you can do it without understanding what you're saying. Read means you comprehend what you are saying with your mouth. You comprehend it, you process it. Our religion is one of understanding, education. Read, not recite. So then learn to read in the prayer, not recite. Understand what you're reading. And when you do these two things together, how will your prayer transform itself? And I started to tell you something and then I paused. You know, when a lot of times when somebody, when you give somebody advice or somebody gives you advice, etc. You know, sometimes there's a response where you're kind of like, I appreciate it, thank you, but you have no idea. You have no idea. Right? Like, I appreciate it, but you don't know. So if I'm telling somebody who's lost their child, be patient, they can look back at me and be like, have you lost a child? I say, no, alhamdulillah. They say, then you have no idea. You don't talk to me. I wouldn't be able to say anything. And losing a child is actually one of the most tragic human experiences. One of our teachers was pointing out to us, what do you call someone who's lost their parents? An orphan, yatim. There's a word for it. What do you call somebody who's lost, a woman who's lost her husband? A widow. What do you call a husband who's lost his wife? A widower. What do you call a parent who's lost a child? There is no word for it. Not in English, not in Arabic. Because it's so... 
it's so difficult of a thought even that you dare not give a name to it. It's not supposed to happen. And the Prophet ﷺ, that greatest human tragedy. And you know, again, some of the youngins might be sitting there thinking like, you know, that's presumptuous to call that. That's subjective. That's your opinion to call that the greatest human tragedy is to lose a child. When you're a parent, then you'll be able to tell me. Anybody who's a parent here can tell you losing a child, there's no greater tragedy than that. The thought can't even enter your mind without destroying you. Just the thought destroys you. So that greatest human tragedy of losing a child, the Prophet ﷺ suffered that six times in one lifetime. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with seven children. And he lost six of them in his own lifetime. So when the Prophet ﷺ says, be patient, you listen to the man. Because he knows exactly what he's talking about. He's been through the greatest human tragedy six times. And the reason why I bring this up is that when you understand why you pray and then you understand the meaning of what you're saying in your prayer, your prayer becomes so powerful of an experience that then your prayer becomes your response to even the greatest tragedy. When he lost his child, Pray. That even at the greatest human tragedy imaginable, which is losing a child, pray. When anything would come up or happen, he would immediately at once go to prayer. And prayer would give him the strength. It doesn't make the problem disappear. Don't get me wrong, I'm not going to sit here and preach some foofy garbage to you. It doesn't make the problem disappear. But it gives you the strength, the conviction, the belief, the clarity, the fortitude that you need to get through that difficulty. That's what prayer will do. It's a direct one-on-one -on -one connection between you and Allah. That will give you strength that you never could have imagined. Beyond your comprehension. Treat the prayer as the treasure that it is. Embrace prayer as the gift that it is. The one-on-one -on -one conversation between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I pray and I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes prayer, as it was for the Prophet makes the prayer the coolness of our eyes. Say ameen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the prayer our means of fighting through difficulty and adversity. Say ameen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make prayer the thing that sustains our souls. Say ameen. Jazakumullah khairan. I'm going to go ahead and call it a session, uh, at least for myself first and foremost, because my apologies, I would stay, spend a little bit more time with y'all, even answer any questions. Um, but I was supposed to be on another stage. Yeah, Dr. Al-Taf Hussein is texting me. Um, so, he said, are you coming to the main hall? If you don't come to the session, don't worry, I still love you. <laughs> He's like my favorite person. But, um, so, I'm supposed to be on stage 20 minutes ago, so I have to depart from this session. Sheikh Walid uh, was not able to make it to this session. I'm just trying to save the brother some embarrassment because you're going to hate this guy if he's like, Sheikh Walid ain't coming, leave, right? So Sheikh Walid was not able to make it to this particular session. Please excuse him. I know Sheikh Walid, it must have, something must have come up and that's why he was not able to make it. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.